So once upon a time, I met a guy on Match.com, and he, like me, enjoyed exploring new restaurants, movies at the Angelica, Central Park. He had a graduate degree coupled with a successful career, a career, and our first date was fantastic. We had soup dumplings, Singtao beer, chemistry flying all over the place. And by our third date, I thought I was off the hook. And I began to hope. And that's when at a sweet Italian bistro on the Lower East Side, I noticed that he was sitting a little further away from me than usual. And that's when he asked, so have you thought about how you're going to manage the duties of being a wife and getting married and having children? And I thought, I said, well, that's simple. I'll just hire someone to do it, like every other New Yorker. <laughs> and that was the last time I heard from him. Sex is a basic drive of humanity. Sigmund Freud proposed that all organisms are born with a set of fundamental needs, and one of these needs is sex. And if this need is not met, a negative state of tension exists. Therefore, dating and the establishment of romantic relationships rank very high among life's priorities. But this priority is much much more complex for someone with a disability. So even though I was a total catch, my date would be significantly likely to be dating much more than me. And that's because he didn't have a visible physical disability. And even though he had, what's interesting is that even though he has more experience under his belt, more notches on the bedpost, if you will, he's probably not going to report a lot of happiness or satisfaction in this area. So this is not my opinion. People are not having good sex. Married people aren't having sex. And people aren't reporting being in happy relationships. But what if this is because we are factoring out an entire group of amazing potential romantic partners, and that's people with disabilities? We are largely left out of the dating picture. Media, society, society, media, everyone included, seems to ignore the fact that we have the very same emotional needs and desires as the rest of the population. So is this injustice born out of the concept of the poster child whose duty is to induce pity to raise money? Or maybe it's a conclusion that we've drawn from mainstream pornography where we see actors performing gymnastic-like stunts with the stamina of bucking broncos or wild, <laughs> wild jackrabbits. The silent message, the more in shape the body, the better the sex. The unspoken conclusion, if you have a disability, you are too sick to have sex. So now let's look at the continuum in our society where sexuality is measured and the traits of being a desirable romantic partner are measured. On the one end, we have the humans of the utmost sex appeal. So for example, we'll have Victoria's Secret models, Playboy centerfolds. On the complete opposite end, we have people with physical disabilities. And it seems like the more one's body deviates from this ultimate sex icon, the more 
desexualized we become, the more taboo the topic and the more damaging the consequences. Now, for most people who deviate from this prototype, we have quick fixes. So for example, we have hair plugs and butt implants and Botox and Viagra, Spanx. But there, for people with disabilities, there, there is no quick fix and there's no magic pill and our dating and sex lives are hit hard. So compared to the general population, we are going to begin dating and have our first sexual experience much later. We will be less likely to get married and will report fewer sexual experiences overall, if any. Now coupled with that, going hand in hand, are of course increased feelings of loneliness, isolation, despair, depression, and anxiety. I remember being at the Miss Wheelchair USA pageant, representing as Miss Wheelchair New York, and I had a conversation with a contestant there in a wheelchair, and she said to me, I don't really understand your platform because all you have to do is love your body and love who you are and finding a date and romance is easy. And I looked at her and in my head I was like, no. <laughs> like, th th that's not how it works. So stere society's stereotypes, misconceptions, are the largest obstacle that we face when it comes to dating and romance with a disability. And this obstacle is the size of Mount Everest. Asexual, physically unattractive, not able to have sex, not able to have good sex, infertile, weak, dependent, won't make a good wife, mother, husband, father. I remember meeting a guy on Tinder and he asked me, of course, this was like in our second line of conversation after, hi, what's your name? He asked me, can you have sex? And I said, can you? <laughs> he wasn't really happy with that. And I have a patient who is in her 30s and she's in a wheelchair and she identifies as being a lesbian and she's never been kissed. And for her, it is so easy to stay in the closet because she people don't assume she's sexual, let alone a lesbian. So what we do is we take these stereotypes and we internalize them because that's what we do as humans. And because if you're told something enough, if you're rejected enough, you eventually believe it. And how could I not believe it? Here I am at this Italian restaurant with my witty retorts, my wildly successful career, wearing a dress that night that left very little to the imagination, and I didn't stand a chance because he could not imagine how I could do it. Adding to this society of misconception is the fact that people with disabilities also aren't included in mainstream media, which is a commodity also largely driven by sex and standards of sexuality and beauty. We are largely left out of, well, almost completely left out of TV commercials, uh, television shows, beauty and ad campaigns. The message, you don't belong here. Your body is too disfigured, too damaged, too misshapen to sell our product. Sex sells and you are not sexy. But 
including people with disabilities into advertising makes economic sense. The numbers are huge. Our population is big. And we have money. And we want to spend it. And we have a lot of it. And if Match.com just included one ad with someone in a wheelchair or a couple in a wheelchair, not only would they normalize this for millions, but they would also successfully tap into a very lucrative market. Now, this makes economic sense for you too. So let's open our minds to the idea that if we include people with disabilities into our dating pool, we will most likely increase our chances to find a happier relationship and a better sex life. So in my private therapy practice, I work on a, key, a couple key factors and principles that I'd really like to share. So first and foremost, I'm going to differentiate between self-esteem and dateable self-esteem. Dateable self-esteem is a concept that I came up with in my practice to address a phenomenon that I always see with people with disabilities. And that's the fact that we actually have high self-esteem when it comes to a lot of areas of our lives. Our loving families, our huge social circles, our great careers. But when it comes to dating and sex, our self-esteem is in the gutter. So now I'm gonna ask you about your levels of dateable self-esteem. Could it be that you are being possibly unfairly influenced by what others may think if your date was on wheels or if they were a little too short or maybe a bit overweight? So many times I'm asked the question, I've never dated someone in a wheelchair before. How does that work? What do I do? So I'm gonna, first I'm gonna put that question into an overall perspective. You never hear questions like, I've never dated someone Asian before. How does that work? Or I've never dated someone Catholic before. What do I do? I'm not gonna give you any magic answer and I have no special algorithm that I've come up with in my private practice you just go on a date. How does any other new relationship work? You go on a date and see if you're compatible. Do my quirks work with his? Do we have chemistry? No special attention needs to be paid. And it's really that simple. I work with clients a lot on feeling sexy and shifting the spotlight off of the disability per se. So one time I asked a client to tell me what they thought was sexy about their bodies. I remember the session very distinctly because I thought it was a simple question with an easy answer. And the, my client looked down, thought about it, looked up, pondered some more, and finally said, I never really thought thought about that before. I don't know. So think about it. What do you find sexy about your own self? Is it something that you really find sexy that you know that's sexy about yourself? Or maybe it's something that you've been told is sexy about yourself. Because you see, people with disabilities, it's not that we're not sexy. We just haven't been told yet. An interesting paradox. People with physical disabilities and wheelchairs were largely seen as having limitations in the bedroom. When actually we're experiencing sex, not bound by the constraints of what normal sex should look like. Think of all the times that you all have had 
sex successfully engaged in what normal sex should be and left feeling utterly and completely disappointed. Now imagine experiencing sex and the body in ways that you never imagined, even in your wildest of imaginations. What we have here is a population who is good at thinking in details. We are creative. We strategize. These are tools that we've developed from living in a world that's not always meant for wheelchairs. And these exact same tools are the ones that can be used in the bedroom to create a unique and amazing sexual experience. I had a patient one time tell me, you know, we think in millimeters. And I think about that all the time. And imagine if we all thought in millimeters in the bedroom, how exquisitely intimate would that experience be? if we used such detail? And what would that orgasm be like if we used a breath or an eyelash or the intrigue of a situation that we never thought could be sexual? So not that long ago, it wasn't cool to be gay. And before that, it wasn't okay to be black. But now, big is beautiful. Interracial marriages, interracial marriages and dating is fine. Gay marriage is legal. And now, dating with a disability is glamorous. It's our turn. Dating and romance has taken a new tone. And we are all free to create great sex and free to experience any body. Thank you.